So uh, for uh, the next talk before the break, uh, we will talk about um, with the March chess higher uh, about when to manage microservices as a mesh or as API. So we continue on the topic uh, of uh, yeah web meshes, web of meshes. Uh, mesh of meshes, right? And you can do uh, any inter inter iteration of, of this. Uh, and uh, what's the relation uh, uh, with uh, uh, with APIs, definitely. I, I see some comments like uh, API without borders. Yeah, we can launch a movement, actually. Uh, <laughs> API without borders. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, we're waiting for Mark to join, maybe. Yes, Mark is here. He's coming on the stage, like a digital walking. Uh, yeah, hello, Mark. How are you? Hi, how are yeah. you doing, Meadow? Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again. You, so, you have to work on your tongue twisters. The web of meshes is managed by a service mesh. Say that 10 times quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's hard for me with my uh, French accent. But let's go for your 25 minutes uh, with a topic uh, that interests a lot of people uh, from our uh, Atani survey. Are you able to share your screen on the third button? Does your laptop recognize uh, the application? And then we are up to deliver the message. Let's see. No. Is this in the slide share mode? Yeah, this is. We can see your screen. We can hear you. The stage is yours. Enjoy your time and stage with our community. Thank you, Mark. For well, thank you first, Mehdi, and to all the organizers so much for putting together this fantastic event. It's uh, great to be back in the same virtual room as all of the, the great API thought leaders out there. And I, it seems that we get even more of us together when we're virtual than when we all have to travel to one location in some place of the world. So it's great to be here. What I'd like to do today is to talk about microservices it's a really hot topic right now and builds on carries on from the theme of apis that has driven the api days conference series for so many years now one of the challenges that we often hear from customers is that uh, they, they ask themselves well when i'm managing a mesh and i have service mesh to as a management approach does that make api management redundant can I manage everything as a service mesh or should, is it too early for service mesh? Should I actually be using API management? So th this talk is to give a bit of a guide on how to think about this problem. Before I do that, I'll talk a bit about what brought us to this place. So what are the key differences that characterize API management and service mesh management? When you look at traditional API management, very often, the type of model that's used for traditional API management is one of a north-south model. It's all about creating a boundary to the enterprise and managing access across that enterprise boundary for, so that consumers can access only the resources that you want to expose. So essentially, it's a digital access point for the business, uh, a way to work with partners or with consumers who are implementing mobile applications or other web applications. The control point is the API gateway. That's the channel through which all communication is controlled, uh, usually in the DMZ, and all the communication through the gateway then gets forward to the different API backends. This is very much encapsulated in tr traditional API management. You have a developer portal, you have uh, approaches to onboard developers, they can find documentation for the APIs they want to use, they have a place where they can manage their credentials to access the APIs and analytics. So a lot, a lot of value on helping manage APIs that are exposed to the public. If we look at an illustration of that, this is an example of managing APIs for external clients, starting on the bottom row with a bunch of different API backends. So these are detailed APIs that have been implemented by different functions in the organization. And very often, you don't want to expose these raw APIs directly to end consumers because uh, developers would be overwhelmed on the complexity and often they'll want to just sign up for one set of credentials and use that one set of credentials to access multiple APIs. So 
many API management vendors have added an abstraction layer or a facade, the ability to define API products. And these create a simplified view of the APIs that make the APIs more consumable. In this example, rather than having five individual API backends, they've been simplified into three products which can be consumed. There's either a, a widget product, which is useful for building into a website. There's uh, an internet product, which is suitable for either building API access into websites or mobile applications. And then for partners, shipping partners, the, this company has made a shipping product available, and that gives access to the logistics API and the tracking API. And the common thing across all of these is that the interface is the enterprise boundary. So all of the API clients are coming in across the enterprise boundary, and that's why we want to care so much about managing access and ensuring that we, we grant access to the right people. So this is traditional API management. If we have a look at service mesh and how to manage microservices, this is uh, a different type of model. If, if you compare it to the north-south, this is an east-west model. Within, API, within microservices, you know, uh, microservices typically use an API type paradigm. Uh, uh, communication between microservices looks very much like communication uh, to a REST API often, uh, although other proto protocols can be used like RPC or uh, event messaging protocols. One of the things that's critical in implementation patterns for managing microservices is a clear separation of the control plane from the data plane. The most popular service mesh uh, implementation, Istio, accomplishes all of its powerful capabilities through exactly that, separating the data plane, which is typically Envoy running in sidecars, from Istio and Mixer, which is in the control plane. One of the key differences between microservices and traditional uh, external APIs is the sheer scale of things. In the past, you were talking maybe tens of APIs that would be exposed by company, whereas within a microservice cluster, you could be talking about thousands of microservices that all have to be talking to each other. And so you need a lot more sophisticated control and routing. Uh, a lot of this is to do with network capabilities for being able to trace uh, which services, depending on which other services, enforcing security standards like mutual TLS, uh, providing black and white lists between for communication between the services. All of these capabilities are provided and managed through the use of a service mesh. So we've seen now a uh, very brief overview of how, what the two approaches look like. Let's ask ourselves then, is it really clear when we look at these environments brought together, you, here you have consumers who are accessing uh, a APIs through the enterprise boundary and the APIs are implemented in a microservice architecture. So is it clear when do you want to use API management and when do you want to use service mesh management? From what I described earlier, it should be very clear. So you've got an element of north-south management, and there's an element of east-west management. If you lay that, overlay this onto the architecture we have here, it's very clear that you want to apply API management for external traffic, that interface to the enterprise boundary. Very often, you would expose those different microservices in this facade of an API product. And then for the microservices themselves, you'd apply my service mesh management, and that would essentially be how you manage all of your internal traffic. Now, it looks great to have such a simple delineation between these two approaches, but things aren't quite so easy. So one of the challenges when we look at how this works in real environments, most enterprises are much, much larger than the simple use case. So in a typical large enterprise that we work with, we see that you have many, many different domain areas that are, uh, where, where applications are being developed and APIs and microservices are being implemented. And each of these domain boundaries 
are used to basically encapsulate groups of microservices. You can think of the microservices within a domain boundary as being like a pizza, uh, a, a pizza t table size team. And it's a group of developers that can work together. They can ask questions of each other. But when those microservices are being exposed to different areas of the company in a completely different domain area, then you're, to you're sharing an API interface with groups of people that you can't just talk to across the desk or that you're not used to talking every day. So you need to have more formalized interfaces, and that's the, the uh, solid dots, the inter-domain APIs that need to be implemented. Within the domain areas themselves, you can continue using the same intra-domain microservice communication patterns as we saw in the previous slide. So the important thing here is that across domain boundaries, you essentially want to manage interfaces the same way as you do between the external clients and the enterprise boundary. So it's not black and white. There's a gray area, and the nuance is to figure out when do you want to apply API management in these much larger, more sophisticated environments. In order to be able to guide us on some of these questions, you can think about what are the differentiating factors between inter-domain and intra-domain traffic. When you think about inter-domain traffic on the left-hand side, that's a, a lot more of a hierarchical relationship between the producer of the services and the consumer of the services. The Within the microservice cluster or the intra-domain traffic, that looks a lot more like a network graph and services are connected to each other within this network graph. The differences between the two are that on the left-hand side, you're talking generally about one-to-n relationships, and on the right, it's more typically one-to-one -one relationships. On the left, you want to take into account that you've got very different consumer groups. Some, some clients may be internal. You may be sharing the same APIs with external clients or pri external private partners. So you want to be able to dif differentiate very different roles for those different consumer groups. And that leads on then to the next point that in addition to authentication, you also want to be able to do authorization. It's the authorization contract that allows you to provide different roles and different access rights for different groups of consumers. Those authorization and access right policies are typically formalized in the shape of contracts uh, within Red Hat and Freescale. We, we use the concept of application plans to formalize these contracts on how a consumer will use a service. On the right-hand side, what you typically find is that the consumers are part of the same team as the producer. So you don't need all of this complexity of formalized contracts. The contract's a lot more implicit. And you don't, you don't need to worry about different types of consumer group because you know these are all the, the developers that you hang out with at lunch. Um, so, or, or over instant messaging is probably more appropriate in times of coronavirus. And so you don't need to worry as much about formalizing contracts. Um, it's enough to just do authentication. You can forget about authorization and different types of access rights for different consumers. And when it comes to being able to document those services, it's enough to just have internal documentation embedded within the code and people are all probably sharing the same GitHub re repository using different repos within the same organization, GitHub. So they just uh, browse through the different uh, repos to see how to use a different API endpoint. On the left-hand side, because you're not talking as closely with the developers, you need to provide a lot more guidance to help to developers discover the right API endpoints. You need to be able to help developers on board, and you do that through a developer portal. And documentation needs to be a lot more sophisticated to help developers learn how to use the APIs. So here we've seen a, a clear picture. What, what are the things that do differentiate inter and 
inter and intra domain traffic. If you distill that into a very simple message, because um, the, the, simple, the bottom line is that on the left hand side, in situations where you want to apply API management, what you care about is the relationship between APIs or services and the consumers of those services. If you don't care about the relationship because it's a one-to-one -one relationship and because the uh, different microservices are all managed by the same developer team, then you don't need the complexity and uh, uh, additional capabilities of API management. Then it's enough just to manage the the services within the service mesh. Within the service mesh, the, the types of capability you need are center a lot more around network control. So it's how to be able to deliver advanced traffic control, how to ensure security between any two endpoints of the microservices. Um, and here often it's not even uh, validating credentials. It's making sure that you have mutual TLS. So um, quite different from uh, public APIs. Resilience is critical, so you want to have a lot more capabilities for things like circuit breaking. And observability is essential because you've got so many, so, so many thousands of services that are potential, potentially communicating. You want to make sure that you know what, what the communication patterns are in real life. So th those are the two key differentiating factors. And often you can just ask yourselves these two questions for any endpoint to decide whether you need to apply API management or service mesh. But typically, um, in most cases, rather than thinking about one or the other, you want to think about using both together. Looking at how that comes together in an overall architecture, so this is sharing the Red Hat stack for application architecture. On the bottom, you have uh, the container platform and Kubernetes, so providing infrastructure right across the board. And then you could be running either traditional architecture, monolithic applications on top of that, or you could be running on the right-hand side, microservice architecture. If you're running a microservice architecture, very often you'll want to be managing that with a service mesh. And then on top, you'll be for the, for the, all of the enterprise boundaries and the domain boundaries, you'll want to be applying API management. And you can do that across both traditional and microservice architectures. As you look at this model, it's important to recognize that there are very different stakeholders for each of these areas. When it comes to microservices and traditional architecture, of course, you have application developers that are creating the code and uh, service endpoints. On, on microservices, you also have dev DevOps closely engaged in the management of the service mesh itself. And on the other hand, with API management, the key users of API management are folks who have a service owner responsibility or an API owner responsibility. And they're, they're, they're the ones who are responsible for promoting the API or service and ensuring that they know what types of consumer are allowed to use the service. I'll shoot through very quickly an integrated use case here. So. This is a, a use case looking at, um, in blue boxes, we see new microservices. In the darker shade, there's a detail service, which is a legacy uh, implementation. So this is outside the, um, the container platform. Um, and then the entire service is being exposed as a product API. When exposing the product API, you want to make sure that external users can only access that product API. They cannot go directly to the review service or the rating service or the detail service. So all external access is managed through that product API. Within the setup, we'll show an example of using API management and service mesh and integrating the two. So looking at service mesh, uh, this is the most popular service mesh implementation based on Istio where you have, uh, in this example, two different services, service A and service B. Envoy is set up as a sidecar to each of those services. So it's a different container sharing the same pod. And Envoy handles all ingress and egress to the services within that pod. By doing so, Envoy 
can make policy enforcement checks and it Envoy refers those policy decisions to the Istio mixer. So that's in the control plane. The integration to API management works by hooking in an API management adapter to that Istio control plane or the Istio mixer. On the API management side, it's a simple matter of uh, selecting the option to integrate with service mesh and then bring these two things together within the infrastructure on the data plane, you're not deploying API gateways separate from the control points that you deploy with the service mesh. So within the service mesh, you're already deploying Envoy sidecars as a traffic control uh, check for each service. So it would be completely redundant to deploy an API gateway in, in addition. That's the great thing of the integration, that you share the same infrastructure, there's no duplication, and then you can selectively choose within the entire service mesh which services you leave to be handled by traditional, uh, by, by standard service mesh capabilities, and only enable API management for the control points which go across an enterprise boundary or a domain boundary. In this case, we've got the product API, which is where we want to apply API management. All requests for access through the product API are referred by Envoy to the Istio control plane, and the, the policy enforcement is, and decision is handled by, by referring the decision to the API manager. That's Red Hat Freescale. So we've seen the the paradigm, how to think about choosing between service mesh and API management for microservice environments. We've seen a quick example of that. One important thing as we think about how to roll this out in practice is that many organizations try to be too ambitious uh, and it's, it's the biggest, if, if I look at what one, one example that's consistent amongst organizations that do not succeed with microservice programs, it's because they try to do too many things at the same time. So my recommendation is that you think more selectively about deploying management for your microservice environments. Decide if you're going to start with an API management paradigm on the left-hand side or a service mesh paradigm on the right-hand side and then make sure that you deploy that capability, that management layer effectively. And, that, uh, and once you're happy with how that works, then start extending in either from the left to the right or from the right to the left. And once again, because you've got tight integration between these two approaches, you can easily migrate and extend capabilities. You will not have any duplication at the tra traffic control layer. So this has been a quick overview. A key takeaway, uh, bear in mind, is that service mesh, always think about using that together with API management. It's not one or the other. And API management is about managing relationships, and service mesh is about advanced traffic control. I'll stop there and see if we have any questions. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, one question about uh, performance. How to minimize the impact of API management and API gateways uh, in in service meshes, it's it's a very common concern that customers have, and one of the key things is to take uh, take full advantage of, of caching at every layer in the environment. So we build in a lot of caching capabilities into the adapter between Istio and Red Hat Three Scale. It's within the Istio project itself. There's been also a rethink about the the model of a separate control plane and data plane. And Istio is uh, embarking on a new architecture where a lot of the policy decisions are going to be devolved to Envoy itself. So more of the policy decisions will be made by Envoy. And we're, we're going to be adapting the integration to, on, to Istio to also tie in directly with Envoy itself. So we're moving with the times and making sure that performance comes foremost. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question about the, the, the culture. Uh, what's the right level of culture to uh, start a service mesh architecture? 
maybe in a sense of uh, you know the level of mat maturity so I, 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 it goes back again to to my comment earlier to take measured steps the uh, the, the companies that that don't succeed very well and the, the cultures that don't uh, struggle are uh, when they try to take on too much at the same time and they don't have a good structure. So uh, probably one of the biggest fails I have seen is a very large uh, uh, organization that had 700 microservices and they didn't really, it was completely uh, a complete wild west with every microservice team deciding what they would expose, who they would expose it to. And it was just uh, like a spaghetti code that you have within the monolithic application. So microservices are not going to help lack of structure in your organization. Get the organization structured first and then work on the implementing microservices. Yeah, Conway's law, always. Thank <laughs> you, Mark. We're, we're out of time. Thank you. And yes, if you want to know more about uh, March presentation or about uh, uh, service, mesh, uh, service meshes, Red Hat, you can go in the booth of Red Hat on, in the expo. We will be back at uh, in 18 minutes, uh, right for the break. And uh, yes, you can uh, begin to network or you can uh, visit the expo or do what you want. And then we will be back in 18 minutes on stage with uh, API specification in the in the first track or GraphQL to make business applications on the second track. See you soon. Thanks, bye-bye.